Uh, obviously, big data is not just a challenge, but it also gives us opportunity to get insights of the new types of data, uh, things that were previously beyond the reach. So my question is, where are we going with big data? And how do we get there? Bruce. Well, my example would be a thing called distribution fault analysis. A friend of mine, John Bowers, at Pickwick Electric Co-op in Tennessee is working with uh, some folks at Texas A&M and putting the equivalent of a PMU out on the distribution system. At the beginning of a feeder, sometimes depending on whether it's a loop or not, maybe a couple more, they're sampling the waveform 250 times a second using algorithms not centrally located at the, at the, at the uh, co-op offices but inside the device, and as they learn from these algorithms, they look at that wave shape and say, that looks like a tree brushing in the line. It sends an exception alert, like a SCADA outage. It says, you got a tree brushing in the line. By the location of that PMU, I can send a crew out, and maybe, unlike what we've done until now, which is recover from outages, is to actually anticipate them and prevent them. So things like a loose clamp, things like a recloser operating six times before it locks out rather than three or four that I've got it set, or not operating in the time frame that I expected, which shows that it's not performing adequately. That's an application that changes the paradigm from building it as robust as we can and then recovering from what we couldn't build it robustly enough for to beginning to intelligently anticipate and prevent difficulties. I can uh, probably add, add to that. I think in general, when you have a lot of data, the first thing is you just want to play with that data and you want to look at it. And uh, whether it was the smart grid or even before that when there was no smart grid, uh, we were looking at uh, data which was a month old. Uh, now we are looking at data which is maybe a minute old. Generally speaking, the first wave of tools uh, have allowed us to slice and dice the data and do what I call historical reporting. I think the promise of big data and the, the modern software is to move historical reporting to more of a predictive world where we can anticipate what is going to happen and we can also decide if we take an action how those actions are going to change the system, which along with the ability to communicate with the devices and, and close the loop uh, uh, allows us to move to a paradigm of uh, predictive control where <coughs> the machines can uh, forecast or predict what's going to happen and take actions to eliminate all sorts of inefficiencies uh, from the system. So I think uh, we are going to see more and more applications which are going from historical reporting to predictive control, and that's where the promise of big data and machine-to-machine -machine communication is, uh, is, is really uh, going to drive uh, efficiency improvements. Thank you. Bruce, Well, there's uh, two areas to, to me jump out, and uh, the first is in the area of water which is, you know, it, it's another utility business like electric, but it has, uh, unlike electric where you can, you know, you can always procure extra fuel to run a, a power plant, at least in the world we know it today. Uh, water is, is so much a function of where, where one is located. So if you're a city in the desert and you have a drought and your reservoir runs dry, you're out of luck. Uh, because there are no cost-effective or practical ways to move water long distances. And so uh, what that gets to is that there's not a, a ton known about how people, individuals and businesses use electricity, you know, on what. And that's, that's where we're, we're doing our research in. But, the, uh, but there's virtually nothing known about how people use water in their homes and businesses. There's been one study ever in the United States on this, and that was 16 years ago. And, and, uh, and, and as we face the nation's fastest growing areas all running out of water, Texas, California, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Georgia, Florida, you know, this, it's, uh, air, uh, it's in New Mexico. This is an area, an, an area where the, many of the things that have been learned in, in the electric smart grid effort are, uh, uh, will have a lot of relevance on a really, really pressing issue, uh, particularly in the highest growth areas in the nation. And, and there's about to be some big money thrown at this, by the way, too. So in the, in the state of Texas, uh, there's probably about, a, a, there's gonna be about $1.2 billion in the next half decade or so invested in infrastructure at the municipal level for, that enables water conservation. 
to put that $1.2 billion figure in context, the amount that was spent by the smart meter Texas utilities on metering is $1.15 billion. So in other words, there's about to be in Texas alone, and that's not, in California will probably do more, and Arizona and Colorado will do a lot. But there's about to be a lot invested uh, to try to figure out how do we learn from the customers and communicate to the customers and water to find out what they're doing and get them to use less. Uh, you know, the other big area, of course, is solar, which has surprised me a little bit how fast it's coming on on the distributed level. It's an interesting technology because or it's an interesting product to emerge because unlike an electric car, which is, uh, you know, electric car, what we see in our research is electric car is fundamentally just like an electric clothes dryer. Uh, in other words, it comes on typically about between 6, a, 6 p.m. and, you know, 6 a.m., and it runs for, you know, two to three hours, the charger does, and it's done for the day. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, so it's kind of like a clothes dryer in that regard. A big load, but it's confined to uh, the evening and early morning. So it's, we know how to, you know, utilities know how to serve that kind of a load. Solar panels at the, on the distributed around a distribution system is a completely different ball of wax. And so the, the, the question is, well, how much of that is being used inside of the home versus being put back on the grid and under what conditions? Uh, because that'll help us understand at what level do you get enough penetration of rooftop solar to really start wreaking some havoc on the distribution system and to develop uh, solutions to respond to it. That is going to re require some really almost like second-to-second -second ability to assess what the condition of the distribution system is on solar. And uh, you know, just to give you my final thought on where, why this is maybe coming faster, we think we're already seeing it in California, where you know, uh, and as you know, uh, and, but uh, there's something that uh, economists refer to as the, the S curve of adoption, and so that new products. They tend to start off in that, you know, zero to five, ten percent, and it's like the bottom of the S. And, there, and then on any innovation, when it gets to about 15 percent adoption, it goes to 60 real fast. Right. And so uh, I, my sense of what I hear from, uh, you know, from some of your colleagues, that's dg and &E is, and, and elsewhere in California, is that California is at the base of the S curve. And as, as goes California, it goes the United States just a few years later. Hi, I'll, I'll, I'll pass. I've been saying okay. enough. <laughs> I, I was just going to say a quick thing. I, I think that big data is really a movement from, uh, especially in the utility business, which I've been involved with for years, is a movement from documentation really to discovery. And, and I think I go back to your word about silos. We've been in information silos as well as process silos and everything else. And so I think when we begin to take those silos and put them together, we will start to connect the dots. And I think your particular issue with the water, I think, is a, is a very, very important one. When you think about the amount of electricity is used to treat water, or amount of energy, and how much of that water actually is being consumed. A lot of it is, is leaking through old infrastructure. So that's one way of certainly by taking the data sources, pulling them to, together. Now, of course, I'm in the business of, of uh, geographic information systems, and so and, and normally in the past, those data sets have been very large and hard to manage, but now, with the technology, you begin to put things together and begin to uncover patterns. And you could take social networking and patterns. Now, you, not only will you find out what the documentation is of your network, but you'll discover what people are thinking about your network, not only about what they're thinking about your network, but actually where they're thinking about what they're thinking about your network. So it's really this mashup. We call it, we call it in the GIS space a mashup. And when you do that, you get this aha moment that says, Look at that pattern, look at that demographic, look at what that consumption is, and you discover things like electric vehicles. We know that people who can't afford electricity or can't afford gasoline aren't buying electric vehicles, right? right. That's yeah. not the right. So we could make those wrong decisions about how we do policy and how we move forward by having silos of information. So I think big data is more about collecting and then doing that discovery. It's really, really exciting. I was on the program with a fellow from Toronto uh, in, uh, at Distributech in San Antonio a few weeks ago. And they've started putting a meter not only at every home, but in every distribution transformer. Yeah. And then comparing not the total meter reading, which is helpful, but comparing daily, by the minute. Uh, they can find things like marijuana grow houses, interestingly enough, six sure. on, six off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they find out a variety of other things that they never even knew they could look for. Yeah. Right. And now, I'm, oh, I see a pattern. 
Uh, th this, we can use this data. And what we're seeing a lot of right now is, is when you have this smart meter infrastructure, you know, even, even the most basic data collection you get from these meters is giving you new insights, yes. right? Because yes. your time synchronous readings of power flows through your network every right. 15 minutes or every hour, right. you know, you, it's the first time we've had that synchronous flow information yeah. all the way down to the very right. node of the network that's at your customer. Now, what do you do with that? I think one of the things we're hearing about just in the conference here is a lot of the industry is facing these challenges about how to move forward, how to modernize the grid, how to deal with the aging workforce, et cetera. Now we have data, and this data can really help make decisions about where those investments should be made, right? Which parts of the grid need this investment? Where would I put additional sensors? Where do I want to look at uh, upsizing conductors or transformers because of load changes and photovoltaics and whatnot? And I think that that is a a great first low-hanging fruit value from some of the data that's uh, bigger than we're used to. Well, I, you heard Mark Rose yesterday. I've, I've been in his control room a number of times, and they, they use GIS, they use outage management, they use a variety of detection, and they've gotten to the point where when they see something that doesn't look right, mm -hmm. for example, the, I was in there one time and they had an outage and they it was on what they thought was a radio feeder. They ping the meters above the outage, sure enough, they're out. They ping the meters below the outage at the end of the radio feeder and they're live. Uh, ordinarily, you'd say, well, the outage management system is bust. They said, no, the circuit model's wrong. Exactly. So we'll, we'll no, tell no. the guys while they're out there to fix the circuit and that's model. They the started to trust the data. The first value in, in some of this data analysis is you know, those interesting things you find probably that circuit model isn't quite right and, and you can fix it. And it replaces some of that subtlety, some of that that in institutional knowledge, their training time for a new dispatcher is a fraction of what it used to be because they've got a circuit model and an outage management system. They don't have to have the guy who worked the lines all those years who knows where everything is. Uh, dear experts, we have a few minutes left and I would like to, uh, for the audience to have a chance sure. to answer the questions. Uh, but before we go there, being at the right place at the right time, obviously is a key factor for success. What, where are we in the timeline uh, of applying big data solutions and what is the price for in action? Jeff. Price for in action. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, a slightly different answer than, than the price for in action on, on cybersecurity, which you know, I, I think there's really very compelling arguments that you, know, you can't stand still there. On the big data space, you, you can certainly take the argument that there are other there are other companies that are you know more qualified, more uh, experienced, and so on to sort of analyze the data than than, than we are. But I'll I'll take the you know kind of the counter is I, I think it really is the lifeblood of at least for the California utilities the next generation utility is as the, as the energy market gets more. Distributed, you know, we have new players. Uh, energy doesn't flow just one way; it flows multiple ways. The, you know, kind of the the utility that that we represent that kind of starts out as a monopoly and is less so over time, a uh, regulated monopoly and le less so over time, needs to understand what the data is telling us on the customer front, on the operations front. And in fact, again, on the IT and security front, to be able to make good decisions about doing what we're chartered to do, about keeping the lights on, about keeping the grid, you know, stable and powered. And uh, you know, unless we learn how to do that and, and learn how to do that quickly, I think our future is a little, you know, <coughs> not bleak, but it's it's in question. Okay. So the the the, the price of doing nothing, I think, or, or of inaction is, at least in my company's point of view, is to become marginalized, is to become more susceptible to disintermediation, and we're like any other company. We're not interested in that. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's such a good point. If you don't do it, Internoc will. Right. You know, we heard Doyle Benneby talk about that very detailed sensing so that they can bid into the market a feeder. Internoc can do that. They do it with Sheraton Hotels. If you don't do it as a utility for yourself, sooner or later somebody else will bid that control into the market. Right. I mean, there is a very uh, famous article that Mark Andreessen wrote a year and a half ago where he's talking about how software is eating the world in industries after industries, whether it's media, 
where Google uh, is, is the standard now, or entertainment where Netflix is. And, uh, and the basic premise actually applies to uh, every industry, including our own. Uh, there is so much transformation that is happening that the price of inaction for uh, players, entrenched or new players, to not use data is that they will simply die or margin get marginalized. I mean, that's as simple as that. It's, uh, uh, everything is an endpoint connected to a software uh, using some sort of intelligence which comes from being able to analyze data in real time uh, at high volumes. And people who are people or companies who are able to adapt to this world will be the winners. Thank you. And with that, we have a few minutes left. And if audience have questions, uh, please, we're ready. Well, I came in late, and I think I caught the best part of it, I'm going to guess. Um, I was thrilled to hear you mention the word disintermediation, Jeff. Um, and I completely concur, Steve, that third parties will provide it if utilities don't. I think it's the only defense. With that in mind, I'd like to talk about the customer end of data and invite you guys to fantasize a little bit with as much as you know about data. My two favorite apps are probably the GPS mapping. I don't have to pull out a paper map anymore, especially when I'm driving myself. And it's just gotten better and better. And Shazam. And so with that in mind, what are your fantasy apps that we might see on the customer side that would allow us to charge customers more money for energy, which I want. <laughs> <laughs> so two, two really, hopefully, really quick answers. Uh, one is that you know, it doesn't have to be a fantasy app. Uh, we are, you know, for example, rolling out our, our first uh, real kind of new valuable application that, uh, that, uh, that has you know, kind of big data principles underneath it. And it's real simple. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be and is becoming a more competitive market. Competition means you, know, you, you care more about what the customer thinks of you. You always care, but you care more because you have competition. And um, so we're, putting, we're rolling out a system this year that basically during the moment of a customer call, we marshal all the data that we have about that person, their, their usage, social data and you know everything we know about this person at a point in time and we provide the call center agent with some next best options for that person things to suggest to make their energy usage more efficient or maybe make their bill go down but you know this this requires a gathering of information that we couldn't do before we can now gathering of it at that exact moment and personalizing it for for that person so that's happening you know as we speak um, as far as fantasy apps, I think, I think one of them is uh, lots of people, you know, we've we got a, a spike in solar roofs across the country and certainly in California. And one of the questions that I think we're going to be in a good position to answer for customers is, are you getting what you paid for? How efficient is your solar roof? Is it producing properly? Is it functioning properly? We can suggest things. So there's, a, there's an app that doesn't exist yet that would be a little bit of a fantasy. I yeah, in fact, you, you, can detect, yeah, you can detect, uh, we've actually started being able to detect uh, malfunctions in solar panels yes. right. off the data. Yes. And, uh, and in fact, we had one house where we went out four times because the data was telling us there was something wrong, but all the usual metrics that an electrician or an installer would go were, were showing no problem. And it turned out that a portion of the array was not, had never been installed. Right. And, uh, but, but when they plugged in to see the panels are producing, the system connection's live, but when they actually went around up on the rooftop, uh, they discovered that. And that was only discoverable through the data. Uh, my Thank fantasy you. app, real quick, is uh, it's in the area of water. And this, uh, you're, if you're the parents of, a, uh, high school, of high school kids and you leave town for the weekend, and on Saturday night at 10 o'clock you get an alert on your phone this said, in the last hour, your toilet has flushed 45 times. <laughs> well, you, you know, you have developed, uh, you know, you know what, you're learning about your water use, but you've ad developed additional insights about what is happening inside of your home. Uh, thank you, Professor. <laughs> uh, next question, please. Thank you, Jeff. My name is Panel. I am Amir Musavian from Clarkson University. Actually, I'm an assistant professor there, and I agree with you that the kids that we have right now uh, are very talented and they can be really good sources for solving the future that we, uh, solving the problem that we may have in future. 
So the question that I have is that how we can reach out to you guys as the CEOs of these companies, big uh, utility companies, to provide us with some data or idea of the problem that we can provide the students with and basically uh, let them to play with this data, let them to uh, be creative and hopefully uh, come up with some innovative ideas to solve the problem that we currently have on a smart grid. Well, I was approached, I sat on an advisory board for the Carbon War Room for some startups and one of them is called TalkBot. And these kids are listening to the chatter on social media and trying to figure out trends that don't, don't really have anything to do with social media. It's sort of like the toilet mm -hmm, flushing. Yeah. And use artificial intelligence to find those trends. And so they've asked me several times, uh, so what's one of your customers that is doing solar gardens that uh, we could look at data from? Well, the rub is that data, how do I scrub that data so that I can give it to you and you can use it without violating any red flag or confidentiality or other issues? But I do think we're beginning to see the kind of data that it would be helpful to have a university group because they might see some things that we would never see because we have those stachomas that Bill talks about. So uh, our company has uh, done a lot in education and we, we actually support universities and usually the software is uh, either very discounted or free. And so we have applications online and you can download them. They're, they're actually open source scripts so, for example, you, there's something called ArcGIS for electric and ArcGIS for gas. You can download them. You can play around with the software. You can do experimentation. You can do these kind of what they call geoprocessing models, which do analytics on the data to really discover. And so you can play around with it. So there's all kinds. And I think not just our, our company, but I'm sure many, many yeah. others. So if you just really are pointed in the right direction, you, you could, uh, you we're, could really we're trying to do something up. similar and, yeah. and set something up in Silicon Valley, not just for the universities, but also for entrepreneurs who have ideas that yeah. might be useful, um, and try to create some sort of seed culture, you know, that, that can uh, that can provide a data platform, right? And this is the real question, I think, is in order to, to do this, you have to take real data, real data. because you can't simulate things because then you don't learn what right. you need to learn. Mm -hmm. right. So you have to take real data, and therefore you need somebody who's going to be cooperative in terms of allowing that data to be uh, used, and you also can't anonymize it too much, because that's the other thing. You you, you don't uh, you know if you don't know that this is the home at this street address, you know, you don't have the other demographic information that is that is important. So, you know, anonymizing data to provide it to researchers is a is a key challenge. I would hope that one or more electric utilities would hire one of your kids. I grew up uh, as a cooperative student engineer at Houston Lighting and Power, mm -hmm. being a cooperative education student. And the utility lets that student play with data. Sure. Um, our panelists will be available for more questions. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. So we started a little bit later. But, uh, I would like to thank you, the panel, and thank you, the audience. Thank you.